So welcome to another Dolphin Communication Project Deep Dive webinar. Uh, even though we are the Dolphin Communication Project, we think it's valuable to learn about all sorts of things in the ocean. And tonight we're going to talk about what does the manatee say? And we are lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Beth Brady. She is a postdoc research fellow at Moat Marine Lab in Florida. Uh, and though her uh, professional career began in the nursing field, um, she is now a manatee researcher focusing on their uh, vocalizations and their acoustic communication. And we are going to turn it over to Beth in a moment uh, so that she can teach us all sorts of things. Um, Kathleen and I are here monitoring the chat. If you're watching live, you'll find yourself muted. That's on purpose. Uh, so go ahead and submit your questions to the chat and we will get to them at the end of the talk. And just a reminder, if you're listening live, we are recording this. Um, and if you're listening to that recording, we hope you enjoy it. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Brady. All right, thank you. I am going to go here and you all can see my screen okay? Looks Perfect. good. All right, like Kel said, I, I first start off, people usually ask me one of the first questions I get was, what made you become a marine biologist and work with manatees? So yeah, as, as previously stated, I was started out as a nurse. Um, I was scared of all the sciences, the physics and chemistries, and I thought, I can't do this. So I went and became a nurse, and you can tell by my screen scrub tops that I always had marine biology on them. I think every one of my scrub tops had a marine mammal on it. And I thought, you know what, if I can make it through this, I can make it through anything. So I went back to school and I started to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, so I went, <clears throat> excuse me, to a landlocked college. It was Kutztown University. It's up in Pennsylvania. And they still like me because they put me on their alumni page, but I went there for my bachelor's degree. And after I finished my bachelor's degree, I was like, well, this isn't quite enough. And there's not really marine mammals in Pennsylvania. So I am going to move to Florida, which I ultimately did after I graduated. And I did a lot a lot of volunteer work. I volunteered for a lot of different organizations. Uh, I gave a lot of talks here. I was as a biologist on board, um, showing some fish and doing otter trawls in the bay. And while I was there, I got to do a lot of work with rehabilitating marine mammals. So this is me in the pool with this very special dolphin. And I bet if I show you the picture, you'll recognize that dolphin. Yeah, that was uh, Winter. I actually got to work with Winter before she lost her tail. So that image was of me with Winter leading her around the pool when she first came into Clearwater Marine Aquarium. <laughs> and so after that, I did all this volunteer work. And said, you know, this is not quite enough for me. I still want to learn more. So I did a nine month internship at Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. This is where I first fell in love with with manatees. Uh, so photo ID is taking images of scar patterns, right? Of manatees, unfortunately manatees get hit by boats. Uh, so you take images of their scars to look at how they, um, the habitats, where they go their habitat, if you can follow animals over time. So I did that for nine months. And while I was there, I knew that manatees made sounds, uh, but I didn't know, that I knew there was, wasn't a whole lot of literature on the sounds that they made. So I became very fascinated by this and I decided I was gonna go on for my master's degree. So I went to Nova Southeastern University, got my master's degree. And this is where I started to look at manatee vocalizations. So I did a couple of different sites and some of these sites that I'm showing you images of here were part of my research. Um, I, first, I tried to uh, categorize their vocal record. But I didn't quite finish there. I finished my master's degree and said, you know what? I'm still really interested. And I went to FAU for my PhD. Uh, but along the way, when I went my PhD, I also got to work with some other unique marine mammals. Uh, one was the North Atlantic right whale. And these are some images that we were able to take from our boat. And I'm gonna play you some of their sounds. So those are sounds from a sag or a 
surface active group, I think it's called, I may be incorrect, they're a social active group of right whales when they're interacting with a couple of different anim animals are interacting with one another. Got to work with some dolphins just really, really briefly. I'll leave the dolphin vocalizations to Kathleen. Um, and last but not least, I tried to work with the sounds of, of alligators. So I love this picture because this represents how field work can go. So I had a gentleman who was interested in looking at infrasonic sounds, which means uh, out of the human range of hearing, of human hearing. So when alligators are ready to mate, they make this bellowing sound, but it also produces what we call a rain dance on their back. You can actually see the water coming up on their back. And this gentleman wanted to record this infrasonic sound that it made. So where do we go? We went to a place in St. Augustine where it's an alligator farm and it's a captive environment. So if you put anything in a captive environment, animals are going to investigate it. So we tried to protect the hydrophone. We put it in this as you see, wooden enclosure, put the hydrophone in there. And um, unfortunately, uh, the alligator treated it like a chew toy and shredded my hydrophone in half. And I have, and every time I've gone back since then, they've outsmarted me and destroyed anything that I put inside their enclosure. So unfortunately, I never got any uh, alligator vocalizations, at least of the infrasonic ones. But anyway, I, I, what I'm really here to talk to you tonight is about uh, acoustics and underwater sound. And I love this image because you can put a hydrophone in the water and hear a lot of different things. There's so much sound in the aquatic environment. But when we talk about acoustics, we talk about how fast the sound travels. So sound travels about 1500 meters per second in water and about 340 meters per second in air. So a lot faster in water than it does than air. So we have a couple of different kinds of acoustics. We have passive acoustics and active acoustics. And passive acoustics is a lot of what I do. I put a hydrophone in the water and I just record the sounds that are happening around me. Active acoustics is actively putting sound into the water. So I have done what's called playback experiments where I place sounds to animals to see how they behaviorally and vocally respond. So what kind of equipment do we use? We use a hydrophone or an underwater microphone. This is what one of them looks like. This is my setup over here of what I use. I have a Pelican case where I put inside the delicate electronic equipment that we don't want to get wet. I put it in a little watertight buoy and attach it to an anchor so I can leave it suspended in the water column. Uh, this is an interesting little uh, acoustic item that we have here. I haven't been able to use one yet, but this is called a D-tag. And a D-tag, as you can see, they have suction cups and actually can be put on the animal itself. So what do we look at the vocalization? So, so this is a spectrogram or a graphic representation of sound. We use special software to look at animal vocalizations. And this is great, right? So here's a graphic representation or some images of some manatee vocalizations. And this looks great, right? This is a clear, great image. You can see your sounds, you can see the vocalizations. But like I said, the ocean is a rather noisy environment. And most of the time we see this. So here's my vocalization right in here, outlined in red, with a lot of different noises in the background. So there's a lot of different noises in the environment. You can have biological, which is made by fish or other animals. You can have anthropogenic noise, which is made by humans. And you can have ambient noise. Think of water crashing or currents or wind, right? So what I'm gonna show you now are some pictures or some spectrograms of some noise in the environment. And I want to play the sounds for you and see if you can tell me what you think it is. And you can put your answer in the chat box or just wait momentarily and I'm sure I'll tell you what it is too. other thing in there as well. Uh, so I usually like to say this is like when you're pouring milk in Rice Krispies. So these lines here are actually coming from something that is biological. And this is what we call snapping shrimp, which are 
ubiquitous <laughs> throughout many environments. Um, so what this is, is, this animal has this large claw here and it creates this bubble. And when it pops, it makes that, that snapping shrimp kind of sound. Next is this one. I'll see if you guys are in the chat. Okay. Uh, so do you guys think this is biological, meaning made by some kind of organism? Do you think it's anthropogenic, made by man, or some kind of ambient noise or just natural noise in the environment? Ooh, biological, excellent. Yes, this is made by a toadfish. So fish make sounds and look at the frequency of these sounds. These are rather lower in frequency. Fish usually make sounds a little bit less or six kilohertz and less. Here's another one. All right, so do you think that's anthropogenic or man-made noise, biological, meaning some kind of organism, or just ambient noise, natural sounds that might be in the environment? You guys have any ideas? So this was not me flushing my, oops, my toilet, right? Uh, snorkel filling with water on a dive. Yeah, kind of. Uh, but this is natural um, ambient noise. So sometimes when you're in the water column, you can have underwater streams. Like I recorded this at Blue Springs State Park and there was some underwater flow or current going through at the same time or near where my hydrophone was placed. But yeah, this is uh, ambient noise. Last but not least, I'm sure you guys probably know what this is. So do you think that's anthropogenic, which is man-made? biological, which is made by an organism, or do you think it's ambient noise? Anthropogenic, you guys are on point. Yes, this was noise made by a boat, which is very, very common, unfortunately, in the manatee environment. So great, so now we know a lot of the other sounds that you might hear in an environment, particularly that a manatee might find, along with a lot of other noises. So when you think about the vocalizations that an animal would create. You want to think about, and this is what I usually think, do they live in groups or do they live by themselves? Animals that tend to live in groups tend to create more vocalizations than animals that don't live in groups. For example, you have the meerkat, right? And a meerkat is a small animal. It's preyed upon quite frequently. They have 13 different calls just to identify which type of predator that they have. 13, that's amazing, right? On the other hand, you have someone like a rhino who doesn't have a whole lot of predators. And they only have really have between three and five call types. Well, what about a manatee? How many call types do you think they would have? So let's talk about manatees for a minute. Do they have predators? And you have in this upper right here, here's an alligator amongst a whole group of manatees. And interestingly enough, at this area, the manatees actually harass the alligator here. So there is some evidence that manatees do get preyed upon occasionally uh, by sharks and alligators, but usually this isn't much of an issue for them. So then more than likely they're not going to produce what we call alarm calls or something to alert you to a predator presence. Are manatees found in groups? Well, from what we know thus far, manatees are commonly found in groups. They do have to aggregate at warm water sites. So manatees don't tolerate temperatures lower than 68 degrees. So they'll go to these warm water refuges. We get these large groups of animals. But most of the time, like I said, it's an aggregation site. So they stay in these groups for very short periods of time, maybe for a couple of hours to a couple of days at most. So not for a long period of time. What about their food source, right? So manatees food source is stationary, they're herbivores, they eat mostly grasses, so they don't really have to cooperatively forage or hunt for the food, though East Coast is another story. Uh, last but not least, they do have their most likely their social bond, longest social bond is between cow and calves. Cows stay with, a uh, calf stay with their moms for about one and a half to two years in the wild, which is the most stable social unit in manatees. So the numbers to think about manatees when you look at its brain, right? So first I want you to pay attention to look at the auditory region of the brain. It's large. This is usually a really good indication that hearing is really important to manatees and why vocalizations might be important to them. Here's their visual cortex, which is rather small. Manatees have hmm, 
fairly good vision, right? But they mostly interpret water. So this really might not be a sense that is particularly important for them in their environments. Last but not least, they have the somatic sensory region. So they're very tactile oriented. They have bristles on their face and on their back, which they think they can use potentially to find their food, find other animals, and potentially detect changes in temperature and even tidal flows. So where do manatee vocalizations come from? How are they produced? So there was a young lady, uh, a colleague of mine, who actually put some hydrophones on the throat and on the nose of the manatee to see where the most energy from the sound was coming from. And what she found was the energy was coming from the throat or the laryngeal region. So what do we know about manatee vocalization? So this is a spectrogram, like I said, a graphic representation of sound. So we do know the fundamental frequency, which I've outlined for you in white. Oops, it's not popping up for some reason. In white, what's well, this lowest band right here in white is the fundamental frequency. It's between two and five kilohertz. Can you hear this? Yes, you can definitely hear this if you're in the water column with the manatee. The dominant frequency band, which is usually right here, is usually the first harmonic above the fundamental, which means this most energy of the sound is coming from. Oh, there it went. Most calls contain a harmonic structure. These bands right here are what we call harmonics. And many calls have frequency modulation. I'll get into what frequency modulation is in just a little bit. So again, we also want to know, well, calves stay with their moms for about one and a half to two years. So do their vocalizations change over time? Think if you have children, you know your voice as a child changes from when you're young to an adult. But what about manatees? Does their voice change too? And last but not least, another question I had was, there's multiple species of sirenians, right? Do vocalizations differ between species or are they the same? So when you look at these different species, you have the West Indian, which is composed of the Antillean and the Florida manatee, the Amazonian and the African, and one of my favorites is the dugong, which unfortunately we won't get into today. Um, but are their vocalizations different? So I want you to think about different geographic locations. I bet you can tell the difference between someone who lives in England and someone who lives here. And even within our own country, I bet you can tell there's a difference between someone who lives in New York and someone who lives in the deep south and has a southern drawl. So different geographic locations can sometimes give an indication that they may have different vocalizations or they may have slight differences in the way their vocalizations are produced or in the con frequency contours of their vocalizations. So this led me to my questions. What is the manatee vocal repertoire? Are there calls associated with behavior? Do the calls change as they age and are calls different between species? So this was part of my PhD dissertation work. And what I did for determine the call repertoire is I put a, a hydrophone down in three different locations. One was in Crystal River and Blue Springs. These were both warm water aggregation sites where I had man, uh, like 15 to 120 individuals. And then Puerto Sueno Park is on the west coast of Florida. It's 20 minutes away from where I live right now. Uh, and that's a summertime aggregation site where manatees come for fresh water because they need fresh water. So I put hydrophones in there. I left them out for at least 24 hours at each uh, site. So I had a total of 72 hours of vocalizations that I had to look through. And I had many, many vocalizations, particularly with a lot of animals, uh, the blue springs and the warm water refuges. So from that research, I determined that there were five call categories. There's the squeak, which is tonal, the hill-shaped high squeak, a squeal, which is a noisy sound, a squeak squeal, which is a combination of the squeak and the squeal, and a chirp. And I'm going to play some of these sounds for you right now. So kind of funny sounding for such a large animal to have such a high pitched sound, right? So this is great. I determined their vocal repertoire, but maybe that doesn't mean anything to the animal. Just because I define these call categories doesn't mean it's important to manatees. So the next step I asked was, are there calls associated with behavior? So how I did this was I did a couple of different sites again. I went to Puerto Sueno Park, it's a summertime aggregation site where manatees come for fresh water. Harbor Branch, which is on the east coast of Florida, it's a passive thermal refuge, meaning it's similar to a warm water refuge, but manatees come in there for to stay warm. 
Singer Island is on the east coast of Florida. It's a saltwater site, and it's also a natural place where manatees can come to find food. And last but not least, uh, Crystal River, which is here on the west coast of Florida. So they did manatee health assessments there, meaning they captured individual manatees in a net and they brought them on shore and they did an individual checkup on them. So I got to record the vocalizations of these animals as they are being captured in a net. So I also had to look at, when you're looking at behavior, you have to look at, well, how many animals do you have? And are these animals engaged in similar behaviors? So the first thing I had to do, which is sometimes difficult to do, is count the number of animals and look at the behavior that they're engaged in. I also wanted to know, did calves make different vocalizations? So I had to determine whether or not I had adults or if I had calves. So what did calves look like? So here on your left, I have a video of a, what we call cow-calf pair, right? You can see this animal is visually smaller than the other one. And they tend to say what we call cow-calf position with the calf just behind the pectoral flipper of mom. Some of these larger calves, they're really difficult to tell apart from adults. So in other observations I had used was indications of nursing. As you can see, this guy over here is going to start nursing for mom in just a second or two. And they nurse right behind the flipper under the axilla there. Yep, there you go. Perfect. So I looked at four different behaviors, right? I looked at resting. Manatees do a lot of resting and they can either rest at the surface where you can see their bodies like that, or they rest at the bottom of the water column. And they'll come up anywhere between six to 12 minutes to breathe. And they'll generally just go back down in the same location where they came up to the surface to breathe. Breathe. I also looked at feeding. So manatees can feed anywhere in the water column. They can feed at the surface, they can feed at the middle, and they can feed at the bottom. And when they're feeding at the bottom, usually they come to surface to breathe less, every, less, every, less than five minutes between uh, breaths when they're feeding. This is cavorting or playing. This is a lot of physical interaction, right? And cavorting can sometimes make what we call mating behavior, where uh, manatees are focused on one female and try to mate with her. And like I said, stress-induced calls, and that's me in the corner there. Again, where the animals were uh, surrounded in a net, right, and brought back on shore to do a health assessment. So I also wanted to look at, remember, if these vocalizations change. So I want you to think of something for a minute if you have a dog or a cat. And a dog barks, right, or your cat meows. And I bet you can tell by the way your dog barks or your cat meows what it wants. Does it want to go out? Does it want food? Does it want attention? Does it want to play? Your dog or cat usually changes their sound just very slightly depending on what it wants, right? And you can hear it. Well, as scientists, we measure some of those features, right, in the spectrogram itself. So some of the features that I measured in manatee calls to see if they differed between behaviors was duration or how long the call was and frequency modulation. So for example, a lack of frequency modulation would be this more tonal sound like this and uh, more modulated would be something like the spectrogram right here. We also want to look at entropy. And entropy is the amount of noise in the call. Sometimes more noise in the call tends to mean more excitement, which you can find right here in this spectrogram over here. So I also divided my behaviors and we call high arousal or more physical or active states such as stress or cavort, which is playing and low arousal states, right? Resting, right? And feeding. Remember I said manatees don't have to cooperatively forage for feed or really hunt for their food. So we determined that was a lower state of arousal. So what did I find? So the first thing I found was out of those five call categories that I determined they primarily used just three of them. Three. So no matter where they were resting, feeding, playing, or stressed, they used the squeak, right? That squeak was ubiquitous throughout. It was in every behavior that I saw. This hill-shaped high squeak was even more interesting because that was highly associated with calf presence. And I'll get to that call type a little bit later in the presentation. And last but not least, this squeal was very dominant too. And I'll tell you where that call type was found in just a little bit. So what about each behavior? So resting. Manatees do a lot of resting, like I said. And I love this picture because manatees can rest not only on their backs, I mean, on their, on their front, but they also rest on their backs too. So what do you guys think? And so this was a, a low arousal behavior. Do you think their calls were more tonal and flat? Or do you think they were more modulated?
Exactly. They were more flat. Mantis that were resting, the squeaks that they produced were more flat. Here's an animal manatee feeding. I'm gonna play some feeding sounds for you. And this is a manatee uh, feeding or some algae right off of the wall. That's luckily how close I got to get to these guys. So they produce squeaks during this time too. Do you think these squeaks were more tonal or were they more modulated? Does sound like chewing. Yes, they are more tonal. Exactly. These squeaks were more tonal. So playing. Let's see if this will play. There you go. This is cohorting or playing. So what do you guys think? Were these more modulated or were these more tonal? Yes, these were definitely more modulated. What I also found here was a lot more of these noisy calls. So in some animals, like I said, these noisy calls could potentially mean aggression. Think of your dog when it's like growling, right? Are manatees aggressive? Well, when they're in these cavorting or mating herds, the males are competing to have access to the females. So potentially that could be considered aggression. And there are, is some literature showing that manatees have been aggressive towards each other in captive environments. Another explanation is just a higher state of arousal, right? More excitement. Imagine when your kids are at the playground, they're like, ah, there might be more noise in their voice. And this is another possibility, but we can't. So we can't rule out either or, but personally, I think it's a little more heightened state of arousal. They get more excited. Oh, and I can play some of these squeals for you, I believe. So those are squeals. To me, they kind of sound like you're scratching your nails on a chalkboard. They're a lot more harsh sounding uh, vocalization. Last but not least, we have these stress-induced calls recorded over 120 manatees being captured in a net. Do you think these sound tone vocalizations were more tone or modulated or more tonal? These were definitely modulated. They were more modulated than animals that were cavorting and more uh, than, than definitely more than the resting and uh, feeding. These calls were also a lot longer in duration. So imagine you're at a horror picture show, right? And something has a jump scare, you call it, ah! <laughs> your vocalizations are usually a lot longer uh, when you're either frightened or stressed. And this is what we saw in manatees. So basically what I was finding with this research that manatees make relatively few call types and they alter the structure of the call depending on the behavior that they're engaged in. Perfect. Well, that leads me to my next question. Now I know a little bit more about Florida manatee vocalizations, but are calls different between species? So like I said, here's a map of where all the Cyrenian species are located. And what I have here for you is a Florida manatee on the top and Antillean manatee on the bottom. Can you guys see any differences in the physical characteristics of these animals? So it's really hard. Whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't let me. Yeah, the snouts, a little bit. Yeah, the snouts are a little bit different, a little bit more deflection in the Antillean manatee. The Antillean manatee is also just slightly smaller uh, than the Florida manatee. So what about their vocalizations? Are they different? So we actually did a study that we're currently working on now, looking at vocalizations between manatees in Belize, Florida, and Mexico. These vocalizations look really similar to one another. So we found they produce similar vocalizations, but they are slightly different in frequency. Belize were highest in frequency. Florida was the lowest and Mexico was just slightly higher. But why? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. Remember, like I said, the geographic differences, that could be a potential reason, but also be habitat. Imagine if you're in a room that's like a, a cave and you can hear yourself echo, or if you're in a forest, your voice and your characteristics of your voice are gonna change slightly just depending on the habitat that you're in, All right? So a couple of different reasons why they might be different from one another. What about the Amazonian manatee, right? So here's the Amazonian manatee on the left, the Florida manatee on the right. 
Can you see any differences between these two species? Yeah, the coloration, definitely the whiteness of the belly. Amazonian manatees, actually, they live in fresh water. Do they have longer flippers? I don't believe they do. I'm not quite sure. Um, but they do live in fresh water. They don't have fingernails, and they're the smallest of the manatee species. So let's look at their vocalizations. So they're actually a little bit different. They're actually a little bit higher in frequency than Florida manatees and the other manatee species from what we know thus far. And that's because they're smaller in body size. All right, so I think a mouse probably have a higher vocalization uh, than an elephant, right? More high pitched. So the interesting thing about Amazonian manatees that we're finding is they vocalize in what we call notes. So remember I showed you for the spectrogram of just like one sound, one consistent sound. Amazonian manatees have notes. So here is this example, it's a note here and here and here, which is what we're finding with Amazonian manatee vocalizations. Last but not least, we have the African manatee vocalizations. You have the African manatee on the left and the Florida manatee on the right. Can you see any differences between these two species? <laughs> yes. So the snout definitely slightly different. Their eyes are also a little bit different too. So we did a study uh, not too long ago with my colleagues Athena Rysik. Uh, they put out a hydrophone in Cameroon and Lake Asa, right? So they put a hydrophone out there for three days. This is what African manatee vocalizations look like. And they found they're very similar in structure to Florida manatees. And the frequency range they found was about three kilohertz. But again, we're not quite sure because this was only three days. Does this really represent the species as a whole? Maybe not. But the most interesting thing about this was that most of these vocalizations were observed at night. Do you have any indications of why these vocalizations might be more commonly found at night? Ooh, that's interesting. Acoustics, well, potentially a couple of different reasons, right? Maybe that's just when they're visiting the area, uh, right? Since it's dark. And that's, that's another thing we think of. So in Africa, these animals are still hunted in some areas. And we think they might be using the area at night, um, basically because they're trying to stay away from being preyed upon by humans. One of the reasons we think so. So another thing that we are looking at, so now that we, we don't know a lot about calves, but what do we know about their vocalizations and how it changes? And are the vocalizations different between calf species? So I had the uh, ability to record, get calf vocalizations from my colleagues, right? So this is what we found when we looked at Florida, Antillian and Amazonian calf vocalizations. So what we're finding, and this is the study we're just working on currently, is that there's a lot of overlap between Florida and Antillian vocalizations. They kind of run similar frequency ranges, a lot of overlap between these two in the parameters that we measure. And just as we thought, these Amazonian manatees, even though they're smaller, right, they're still higher in frequency even as calves, right? So we're finding some differences there as well. So remember when I talked about, do these calls change with age? And this is what we're working on right now, right? So this is what we looked at just using the vocalizations from the animals that we had as calves. And we have a couple of different sizes of calves. So what I have here you, for you along the top is the lengths of each of the calves that we measured. And these are the representative spectrograms of each of the individuals that we recorded. So if you notice, there's this hill-shaped high speak, right, that starts to flatten out with age. You still have some hill-shaped here in this animal, about 190 centimeters long, but it starts to flatten out as they get older, right? So that's for the Florida manatee. Interestingly enough, same thing with the Antillian manatee. We're finding these hill-shaped calls. And they start to flatten out into the more adult type squeak as they get older. So this is interesting. And currently I'm working at Lowry Park. So I'm actually going a little bit deeper into this. I'm actually following these individuals 
over time. So we'll be going, I'll be going on a monthly basis. At the same time, they'll be measuring these animals, and getting the length of these animals, are going to be recording their vocalizations. So we can kind of pinpoint a little bit better approximately where that hill shape starts to flatten out. But why is this important? Well, in Florida, it's somewhat easy to study manatees, right? They aggregate in their warm water refuges. But the tropical environments, they really don't do that as much, right? So we need to find other tools and other methodologies to study these animals. So one of the ways we can do that is using underwater sound or acoustics. So you can put a hydrophone in the water and one, determine whether or not animal is there. And two, potentially if we can look at these hill shape calls, we can determine whether or not a calf is there and the proximate size of the calf right? Is it a year old? Is it more than a year old? Something that would give us better information that we might need moving forward to better conserve the species. And with that, that is my talk, and I am happy to take any of your questions. Oops. Thank you so much. Um, that was very informative and I look forward to some questions as well. I'm just going to um, pop up our little wrap up slides if my computer will respond to my touch. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so to folks who are looking for more recorded webinars, uh, you can find those on our website. Just head to the education tab and under that you'll find webinars and then you'll see upcoming talks, uh, previously recorded talks, uh, or you can go to our YouTube channel um, and subscribe if you want um, and catch everything wherever you prefer. Um, and this was a deep dive, so you can see the topic was a little bit more advanced, the terminology, it's a little bit longer. Our dolphin lessons are geared uh, more towards kids, but or the young at heart are welcome as well, um, and they're a little shorter. And then if you've gone through all of our webinars and you need more, do check out our podcast, The Dolphin Pod, um, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and if you've had enough of DCP virtually and you want to join us in the field, um, we do still have a couple of spaces if you're listening to this in April or May um, for our July 2022 Eco Tour. Um, and if you're watching this in the distant future, reach out, see what um, programs we have coming up. And of course, we wouldn't be a good nonprofit if we didn't remind you how you can support us. Um, we're very happy to offer our webinars, our kids science activities, our podcasts um, free of charge. But of course, it takes our supporters to keep those things going. So you can support us by adopting a wild dolphin, becoming a member, buying some swag, joining us in the field, um, all sorts of things. And just stay in touch so you can get more information at our website um, and on our social media media. Um, so with that, um, we will hit up some questions. Um, and if it's all right with uh, Beth and Kathleen, we'll start with Amber Lee's question here. Um, is it possible to isolate female versus male calls in a mating herd to see if the female is vocalizing differently? I think Kathleen can attest to this as well, but it's extremely difficult to localize to individuals when they're in a, a large aggregation like that. If they split off, you can do something called localization, which localized to an individual. And then you'd still have to see uh, which animal it was. And with manatees, it's, it's pretty difficult unless you have an idea of their scar pattern. And then sometimes we know which one's male and female, but it'd be really, really difficult to, uh, to do that in the wild. It's really hard to localize to begin with uh, when there's large aggregation of animals, particularly when they're on top of one another. And especially when they're on top of one another in a mating herd, it's really, really hard to identify the individual and whether or not it's male or female. We do know that females are a little bit lower in frequency uh, than the males, but other than that, it's really difficult to distinguish between the two. Thank you. That leads, I think, to another question. Um, and you may have said it, but someone was looking for some clarification when you were talking about the calves vocalization yes. changing. How did you know that the calf was the vocalizer? Ooh, they were isolated. 
<laughs> so that's the word, do we isolate the calf? So there's a couple of different methodologies. One was isolating the calf. So it was the only one in the tank. The other way we use is by listening. So you can hear when an animal is closer to your hydrophone and then when it's further away from your hydrophone. So we put a hydrophone in when there was a, one other animal in the tank and we were, I was actively listening to see, okay, the animal's right in front of my hydrophone, the other animal's over there in the corner. So I'm gonna assume the animal in front of me is the one making the call. And I would annotate into a second recorder, like animal made a sound and the animal was close to my hydrophone. Um, and we get this question for uh, dolphins a lot. So I'm going to insert it for the manatees. Do they give any visual indication that they are vocalizing? Oh, yes. So that was one thing I didn't mention. Sometimes what you can see is a wrinkling of the nose right up here. That was one thing I didn't talk about with it with when she put the hydrophone on the throat and on the nose. You can see the nose moving uh, when they're uh, vocalizing. But visual indicators, other than that, it's really difficult. I, I haven't really noticed anything uh, that really gives an indicator that they're making a sound other than the visualization of, of the nose moving which is sometimes really difficult to see. Kathleen, did you, were you ready to add something? Yeah, I, yeah, I was. Well, I, that was, I had two questions. One, you just asked it. So that was pretty cool. Cause I wasn't, I didn't think, I, I figured manatees were like dolphins and being swimming ventriloquists for the most part. <laughs> and, and, uh, but you mentioned earlier when you were when you were talking about the different types of sounds individuals make, you you offhandedly reference signature whistles in dolphins. Mm -hmm. Do you know if manatees have any individually distinct traits to any of their calls? Has that is there enough information to to look at that? Yes, there's in, there's definitely individual distinction in there that they can use to identify offspring. So uh, Renata Souza Lima, who's a colleague of mine, is actually working with me on the calf vocalization stuff. Uh, she determined she did playback experiments, right, where she played the sounds of an unrelated calf to uh, a female and then the sounds of a related calf. So she could identify the, the mom could identify her calf and didn't do anything with the unrelated calf. And so what we'd like to do, and it's really difficult to do to get moms and calves together in captivity, it rarely, if ever happens, uh, but we do have that sometimes in Mexico. So we would like to go to that area. They do do some captive breeding. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna try and manipulate some of the calls to see what they're honing in on to recognize their calf, but we're not quite sure what they're honing in on. We know it's something, we think it might be the frequency modulation. We think it might be frequency parameters that are individually identifiable to them. Um, but we're not sure quite specifically what it is. Could be the harmonics too. And the the um, leading from that, when you presented the information on the calf data, when you had the the uh, their lengths and then mm -hmm. the spectrogram. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming that for each of those gra those uh, slides that you showed, that's one animal as it grows. Correct. So okay. well, actually, it's those are five different animals on the slide. So. Uh, yeah, so each of those are an individual animal that were different animals at different lengths. Uh, what I'm doing now is using one individual and tracking it over time. So okay. we're just getting some general ideas just from that information, um, but then I'm going to track an individual over time. Because it might be interesting if you're tracking an individual over time to see mm -hmm. what portions of the call remain unchanged, because that may have mm -hmm. the, the identifiers in it. I'm really excited about that now because there's five calves right now at Zoo Tampa where I'm going tomorrow and I'm recording their vocalizations. I have one that's like 145 centimeters, one up to, uh, they're starting 175 and they're going to be there for hopefully at least the next year or so while they're growing cool. out. So I am going to follow them and every time they, mm -hmm. you know, are ready to measure yep. them, be isolated and I'll put my microphone. Very cool. It. So I'm really excited about that. We're also, uh, Andrew Lee can attest to this, we're collecting their heads because um, we want to look at the morphological characteristics and how the anatomical features change over time. Because what I didn't get into is the source filter theory where animals produce vocalization from the focal folds, it resonates in the head. And we know from manatee vocalizations that the calves tend to emphasize higher frequency or higher harmonics uh, than older um, animals and we're like, well, well, but why? What's happening there? So if you look at um, the source filter theory, it's like with these resonance or formats, but those are for terrestrial animals. What about marine animals? We're seeing something similar, um, but I would just 
we don't quite know what it is. So if you're, uh, we're working with Joy Reidenberg, uh, who did the study of the vocal yep. folds. Yep. So we're gonna work with her to look at the, the anatomy of calves and their nasal passages as well, as well as their vocal folds and see if they lengthen with age. Cool. Yeah, cool. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it'll be fun. You have to yeah. keep posted. Definitely, definitely. Cool. Definitely great to hear about the collaborations that are going on um, and bringing, you know, different scientists and different locations together. Um, that's really encouraging and very nice to hear. Yeah, dolphin. I mean, uh, sorry, Serenians are a rather small community, so it's mm -hmm. nice to, be able to work with a lot awesome. of different. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brady. We appreciate your time, your expertise, uh, your stories, your videos, your talk, the information, all of it. Um, and we hope that our viewers and listeners enjoyed it as well. And uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Bye.